your Bibles to Zechariah. It will be in chapter 10 today. I'm going to read the whole chapter. This is almost the rest of the answer. Ask the Lord for rain in the springtime. It is the Lord who makes the storm clouds. He gives showers of rain to men and plants of the field to everyone. The idols speak to see. Diviners see visions that lie. They tell dreams that are false. They give comfort in vain. Therefore the people wonder like sheep, oppressed for lack of a shepherd. My anger burns against the shepherds. And I will punish the leaders, for the Lord Almighty will, will care for his flock, the house of Judah, and make them like a proud horse in battle. From Judah will come the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler. Together they will be like mighty men trampling the muddy streets in battle. Because the Lord is with them, they will fight and overthrow the horsemen. I will strengthen the house of Judah and save the house of Joseph. I will restore them because I have compassion on them. They will be as though I had not rejected them, for I am the Lord their God. And I will answer them. The Ephraimites will become like mighty men, and their hearts will be glad as with wine. The children will see it and be joyful. Their hearts will rejoice in the Lord. I will signal for, signal for them and gather them in. Surely I will redeem them. They will be as numerous as before. Though I scatter them among the peoples, yet in distant lands they will, be, they will remember me. They and their children will survive and they will return. I will bring them back from Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them to Gilead and Lebanon, and they will, there will not be enough room for them. They will pass through the Sea of Trouble. The surging sea will be subdued, and all the depths of the Nile will dry up. A serious pride will be brought down, and Egypt's scepter will pass away. I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. Now as we continue in the chapter 10 here, remember that it's this part of the oracle. This is part of the oracle that began in chapter 9. Now an oracle is a message from God that usually comes as a response to an inquiry. We talked last week about the inquiry here being the building of the temple. In other words, we built this temple here, God. Now what? Because Yahweh's answer comes in chapter 9, 10, and part of 11. And so we join, we join this oracle in the middle as the answer is shifting gears a little bit. The first part focused on Yahweh appearing to his people. And it was the expectation of the people that since his glory left the temple in Ezekiel, now that they've rebuilt the temple, they're anxious for his glory to return. That's their expectation. So we know that Yahweh's glory would indeed return, but it wouldn't be until Jesus came. 500 years later. That's a long time. 500 years. And, 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 and Jesus entered the temple declaring that it would be destroyed again. The, the temple that they just finished building. Jesus walks into that temple one day and says it's going to be destroyed. That doesn't, the people didn't enjoy hearing that. They, they, that, that was their pride and joy. Jesus is coming and saying they're gonna, he's going to destroy it. And so it was, um, again, not what they expected, but he's going to rebuild it in three days. You see, um, that, that confused him. But great things will happen on that day. And at the end of chapter 9, we read that Yahweh will save them on that day as the flock of his people. They will sparkle his land like jewels in a crown, it says. This is the day that people are longing for, and they firmly believe that since they built the temple, that Yahweh should indeed act on their behalf. This is what we did, God. Now what are you going to do? And so, uh, and that's kind of, sometimes that's our expectation too. We think if, if we do A, God will do B. But that's not how, that's not how Yahweh works. You know, that's just not how it works. This is why Yahweh gives the answer that he gives. See, after the firm prophet promised to appear and to save them, his answer continues. And he says, you know, ask me. Ask Yahweh for rain in the springtime. Because it, 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 it's Yahweh who makes the storm clouds. He gives showers of rain to men and plants filled to everybody. Everything that is or ever will be that is good comes from God. You know, even, even, even the rain. And, and for the most part, most of the time we want it to rain. Sometimes it rains. When it rains on our parade, we're not happy about it. But when it rains, when we need the rain, we're, we're okay with it. So I never know what God does when half the people are praying for rain. And the rest of us are praying that it won't rain because we want to play ball. I mean, um, it can rain after the ball game, can it? It can rain all night for all it wants. Just 
the whole game wouldn't want to play. Right? But everything that's good comes from God. But he still wants us to ask him for it, doesn't he? He wants us to ask him for it. And the people's, people of Zechariah's day should also have known that. But Yahweh wanted them, and he wants us to ask for these things. In asking him for these things, like rain and like plants, we acknowledge again that it is that it's his. It's not ours. And we are not entitled to this stuff. See, it is and always will be a gift from God. See, that, that the, the world wants to teach you the total opposite. You're entitled to that. It should be, you, you should have this, you should have that. Watch any commercial on TV and tell me if they don't tell you that somehow you deserve, you deserve this, you deserve a break today. I'm showing my age. You know, uh, when you start referencing commercials that these teenagers have no idea what you're talking about, I'm like going, that was a commercial for you. Wow, okay, I'm old, but that's okay. You're chuckling like you get it too. So, huh? so that's okay, you can be older than me. But everything we have is a gift from God. But he wants us to ask for it. It's the, it, we don't have it coming to us. After all, he could decide to not make it rain. It's happened before. You know, when verse 2 moves, things in a slightly different direction. But those that make a point. Now he says, you the idols speak to see. Diviners see visions that lie. They tell dreams that are false. They give comfort in vain. You know, it can never be emphasized enough just how important it is to believe the truth. There are and always will be tons of lies. I tell people lies are like computer viruses. You never know where they're going to come from. You never know where they're, or what you're going to have to do to get rid of them. You just have to wait for it to happen. And all of a sudden, there's a virus on your computer, and you're like, ah. then you got to get rid of it. Or you got to get a whole new computer. So you never know what's lies, what lies are going to come out tomorrow. But as believers in and followers of Jesus Christ, our calling is to believe and to proclaim the truth. And we have a very real enemy in Satan whose sole purpose is to keep people from believing the truth. And he'll use any means he can to spread anything that isn't true. He'll say one thing one day, and something totally contrary the next day, and not bad an eye because he's all about lies, because there's nothing to lose. And anytime somebody asks me, like, why is it like that, or, or, or why, well, why are we the ones that have to leave? Why don't the people that are doing it wrong have to leave? Because Satan doesn't build anything, does he? He steals, he kills, he destroys. That's all he has to do. So he's like the little kid that when you're trying to build the tower and he comes and knocks it down, which is fun when you're a little kid because that's what you do with your little, you, you build the tower and the little boy knocks it down and he goes, yay, and then you build it. And it's fun. But it's not fun when you're trying to build the kingdom. And the enemy comes in and tells lies. And see, so he uses idols. He uses diviners. He uses people who tell dreams that are false. Anything to give comfort, but comfort that is in vain. People who choose to believe lies and liars wander like sheep, oppressed for lack of a shepherd. You know, uh, if, if you want to stop being oppressed, stop believing lies. It's really that simple. Jesus addresses this head on in Matthew 9, 36. You know, when he says that he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus tells the disciples that the harvest is plentiful. It's like, guys, there's, there's so much to do. But the workers are few. Well, I was playing on being poetic there. <laughs> There's so much to do, but the workers are few. So they need to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. See, there's nothing worse for a sheep than to not have a shepherd. Or for a sheep to have a bad shepherd. See, at the end of Zechariah 10:2, after Yahweh talks about the liars, he says, Therefore, the people wander like sheep oppressed for lack of a shepherd. Now remember. In Zechariah's day, there are 500 years before Jesus. But they're suffering at this time because of lack of shepherd. So when Jesus comes, 500 years later, they're still wandering like a sheep without a shepherd. That's a long time to wander. And a lot of people come and go, and, and, and they're wandering like sheep without a shepherd. I mean, nobody, Jesus says they're harassed and they're helpless. And I don't know about you, but I don't think, I don't think anybody likes being harassed. I don't think anybody likes being helpless. Those are not things that we seek out. Hey, what do you want to do today? Let's go find a way to get harassed. Let's go be helpless. That's just not on your list of things to do. And so, but, there, but then here's the crucial part. Yahweh says in verse 3, My anger burns against the shepherd, the, the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders. He never gets angry at the sheep in this case. It's not the fault of the sheep. But it's the leaders, it's the shepherds. And he promises to punish them. And anyone who's lied to the flock or caused any of the flock to wonder, 
will be punished. And I, I, I uh, on my end of things, I find that is good news. Because the people that are telling you to do it wrong are going to get what's coming to them. Now, it's not my job to punish them. Some days, I, I would like to make some suggestions. But if you ever give them my opinion, I can tell you what I would do. You know? But they, he doesn't do that. But, but, but as a shepherd, I, I take that very seriously. Because a long time ago, I met with a fellow from a different denomination that I was interested in joining. I was really interested in joining. And they were interested in welcoming me, so we got together to talk. And it was all said and done. This fellow did something I never thought anybody would do. But this is what he did. He encouraged me. He said, you need to stay with the United Methodist Church. I wanted to hit him. Because I wanted a better, I wanted a different answer. I wanted a, yeah, come with us. We're doing it right. And this is what he said. He said, your job is to proclaim the truth. And wherever you decide to go, that's going to be true. Wherever you go, there will be a backdrop of lies. And you need to decide where you're going to proclaim the truth and which backdrop of lies God wants you to proclaim it to. Yeah, that makes sense. That, was, that, that makes sense. Okay, was, okay so there's, there's, it doesn't really matter where you go. You're going to find lies. People believe in lies and people need to hear the truth. You know, and good people who are believing the truth. And I can tell you confidently I was trying to get away from a lie. Specifically the lies that are being put forth from leaders within the United Methodist Church. And once I realized that there wasn't anywhere to go to get away from all the lies, it was pretty simple. Proclaim the truth at all costs and at all times. The only one who likes lies is the devil. The only one who wants you to believe a lie is the devil. And we're all like sheep. We need a shepherd. One who will lead us in the right way. The way of truth. Lies, while promising good things, fall apart in the end. Those who lead people astray will be punished. And again, like I said before, that's good news. And once it dawned on me that that's not my job. Because uh, then, then when, when you start connecting the dots the right way, because I talk about puddle a lot. I mean, I, I, at least in my head I do. If I don't talk about Bob Puddle enough, then let me know. If I haven't mentioned the puddleism, then it's been too long. But he always used to say, if you want the secret to a long, successful career in ministry, just do your job. Let God do his. Don't get the too confused and you'll be all right. So once I realized, hey, it's not my job to punish the liars. And you really think about it, think about what, what, what God can do to them. They were, it's look way better than what I can do. You know, um, and that's okay. You know, um, those people who let us who lead people astray will be punished. That's good enough for me. That's good enough for me to say, okay, God. Um, now sometimes I encourage you, go get them. Go get them. You know, whenever you're ready, just let me watch. You know, sometimes I get to watch, sometimes I don't. But he goes on to say, for Yahweh Almighty will care for his flock, the house of Judah, and make them proud like a proud horse in battle. David says way back in Psalm 23, the kids remember this, that the Lord, and when he says, Lord, he says, Yahweh is my shepherd. And in John 10, Jesus declares that he is the good shepherd. He is Yahweh that David spoke of. He is the shepherd of his people. He is the fulfillment of Zechariah 10. It only took 500 years. That's okay. If it takes 500 more years, that'll be okay. Because with God, a thousand years is like a day. 500 years is only half a day. Because Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He will care for his flock. The house of Judah make him like a proud horse in battle. Let that, let that business sink in. Because the rest of chapter 10 is about how the shepherd is going to look. Verse 4 says, From Judah will come the cornerstone. From him the tent peg. From him the battle bow. From him every ruler. You see, Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is the tent peg that holds the tent in place. You know, when the, you know, I mean, I don't know if you, I've, I've never, I don't think I've ever spent the night in a tent. Not that I can remember. But I know if you're in a tent and the big gust of breeze comes down, guess what you want to hold? You want that tent peg, the dead tent peg to do what it's supposed to do. Because I don't think the tent would blow away with me. But I think I can hold the tent down. <laughs> but it's uh, but you want that tent peg to do its job. The battle book. You know, Jesus is our all in all. Jesus is the lion from the tribe of Judah. Judah. Jesus is the ancestor if we trace back to that tribe of Judah. He's who Zechariah was talking about. Verse 5 says, Together they will be like mighty men, trampling the mighty streets in battle. And because Yahweh is with them, they will fight and overthrow the horsemen. 
I will strengthen the house of Judah. He says, and save the house of Joseph. I will restore them because I have compassion on them. Again, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 9. That he wants compassion on them. Why? Because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus is like, he feels sorry for them. He's got compassion because it's like, wow, they are totally being duped by bad people. And one by one, from verse 7 through verse 12, Yahweh's oracle is the answer pointing to how he will take care of his people. The Ephraimites will be mighty and glad. Their children will see it and rejoice in the Lord. He will signal for them. And they will be as numerous as before. Even though they were scattered, they will remember Yahweh. They will survive and return. Yahweh will bring them back from Egypt. See, I'm, I'm kind of glad we walked all the way from Egypt to the promised land because Jesus is going to retrace the steps sometimes. We go back from Egypt, gather them from Assyria, bring them to Gilead and Lebanon. They'll pass through the Sea of Trouble. You see? Pass through the Sea of Trouble. Assyria's pride in Egypt's scepter will be brought down and pass away. The most powerful people on earth. The most powerful kingdoms and nations on earth at the time will be brought down by Yahweh in that day. And he says he will strengthen them. And in him and in his name they will walk. You see, Ephraim represents Yahweh's people who've walked away. Who've chosen to leave the fold. Gotta go, gotta go back to Psalm 78. A psalm attributed to a fellow named Asaf. Who tells the history of the Jewish nation from the time of slavery in Egypt up to David's day. And if you, followed, if you followed the oracle there in chapter 10, that sure sounded like from Egypt, clear up through David's day, didn't it? It says, it says in Psalm 78, the men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done and continued to sin. You see, the biggest problem is you forget what God has done. And it says, you know, it's a, it's a hey, he got, he's come through before, he's going to come through again. Chapters 78, 67, those are big numbers for, for Bible verses, but Psalm 78, 67 says he rejected the tents of Joseph, and he did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. See, Ephraim deserted Yahweh and his people, yet in Zechariah we see that Yahweh is ready to forgive and bring them back into the fold, because that's what the good shepherd does. That's the answer to their question coming from the oracle. Jesus will be the answer. He will be the good shepherd. He will do all those things, and he'll even bring back into the fold those that have rejected the promise. Yahweh always shepherds his people. Even though, even those who choose to walk, chosen to walk away, his gate is always open to those who wish to walk with him. But remember what he said. Broad is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate. The gate's open, but it's a narrow gate that leads to life, and it's only through Jesus. He will strengthen them, and in his name they will walk. And he takes care of his people. Always has, always will, and we are his people today. If we walk according to his word. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk in the name of Yahweh. And then trust that he will indeed strengthen us because he is the good shepherd. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Lord, great shepherd. We thank you for leading us. We thank you for guiding us. We're trusting you, Lord, that... Um, Lord, that you're going to bring us to the green pastures, the still waters, Lord. And Lord, sometimes, um, as uh, David says, you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but Lord, there's nothing to fear. And we pray, Lord, that you will lead us and guide us all the way. We thank you for being the answer. Lord, there is no other answer, no other answer but Jesus. And we pray, Lord, you will indeed take care of us, Lord, all the way in your name. Amen.